welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to um, the uh, second session on uh, postcards of old New York. Um, let me uh, briefly introduce our speaker who uh, will tell us more about himself and of course what we're going to be talking about today. So hi, Miriam Polsky has been a friend for many years and um, like me was in qualitative research, but he had a side gig, a side hobby that has become more and more important to him, I think, as he has retired um, from market research. And that is that he is a uh, collector extraordinaire of um, postcards, vintage postcards of uh, our wonderful city, New York. And for those of you joining us by Zoom or not in New York, you'll love him also. So, um, hi, I turn it over to you to tell people about uh, what today's session is on, and uh, we're happy to jump in. We'll uh, have uh, time probably for a few questions at the end. It's a very full, uh, a full meal of postcards. So thank you very much, uh, Hi, for being with us. All yours. Hey, thank you very much, Judy. And um, I want to uh, welcome uh, all uh, the folks from CLNL and uh, the folks from the Metro Club of New York City and uh, people from the uh, Wichita Postcard club who are uh, also participating today. Um, this is part of our ongoing series called uh, Wish You Were Here, uh, uh, New York City Postcards from the 1890s to the 1960s. And uh, this was for everyone who uh, uh, understands the history of postcards. This was the age of the postcards when uh, postcards were uh, are one of our major forms of communication. Uh, they've since largely been uh, superseded by the email, but the advantage of the postcard was that uh, they were typically uh, associated with an image on the back. And the, these postcard images are not only collectibles, but have become very important as uh, historical documentation of what uh, culture and lifestyles were like uh, during the period covered by uh, postcard history. So um, today's session is on restaurants, uh, restaurants of the 1890s to 1960s, which are very, very thoroughly documented by postcards. Uh, I'll be able to show you about 70 postcards today, but I have about 5,000 uh, restaurant postcards from New York. So. Uh, needless to say, they had to be selected very judiciously, and uh, there's a story that they tell. And the most important part of the story is that New York is where the modern restaurant was created. It was a local invention. And um, what's, um, what's the modern restaurant? Uh, restaurants in, uh, uh, in particular were invented about the time of the French Revolution, and they were invented primarily uh, as, uh, as uh, usually connected with the health spa. Uh, going out to eat was, uh, uh, was uh, associated with restoration of the body and the spirit. And uh, it was that way until uh, it got to New York. Uh, uh, restaurants were typically associated with resorts, uh, hunting lodges. Um, and, but when they got to New York City, uh, they became, let's call it uh, more than that, they became kind of a form of entertainment. Uh, New York City being uh, the uh, place where nighttime was created as a frontier. Uh, so what we mean by uh, uh, the, um, uh, the picture postcard of restaurants was that restaurants generally published images of themselves uh, to uh, promote themselves, to uh, uh, showcase a particular promotion or offering. And uh, restaurant postcards represent a, a curious symbol of art and design and entrepreneurialism and cuisine. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. So by a modern restaurant, what I mean is uh, place that was generally open to the public. It was a closed institution available on a spontaneous basis. And many restaurants, uh, even from the very beginning, uh, 
Uh, we're open 24 hours a day. Imagine that. Um, uh, restaurants uh, were uh, very different from one another. They offered different types of meals, modes of preparation, and uh, made available a wide range of experiences. And we'll, we'll take a look at this range of experiences that were depicted on uh, New York City restaurants of the period. Um, there was something for everyone, and there was a restaurant from everyone, and that's uh, something to uh, uh, admire and respect. There was something very democratic about restaurants. You could find restaurants where you could get a meal for a dime, or very expensive, very fancy, elegant meals. And uh, restaurant um, uh, postcards represent the entire range, as we'll see of uh, this restaurant experience. Um, and as I said before, it was uh, largely not just for nutrition, not just for, uh, you know, its uh, gustative benefits, but it was uh, New York City restaurants were a, uh, 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 an experience in themselves, an uh, experience of conviviality, uh, friendship and everything else. Now, uh, European cities had restaurants, uh, uh, Paris, Vienna, Rome, London, Budapest, they all had famous uh, places to eat, many of which are still open, many of which uh, uh, we've been to, uh, many of which I've been to together with Judy. Uh, but uh, uh, New York was different. So why did New York what made New York different as far as restaurants were concerned? And what made it such a great place for restaurants? Well, first of all, immigration. Um, uh, millions of people entered New York from the 19, I'm sorry, from the uh, 1880s to the 1910s. And immigrants created uh, a, a ready market, uh, a cadre of specialists, and a labor force to uh, populate these restaurants. New York was also a port and a transportation hub. Uh, no other place in the world, literally, uh, could source uh, ingredients and foods and uh, everything else as well as New York could. Uh, New York had a tremendous wholesale infrastructure, uh, many of which were also uh, uh, illustrated on restaurants. We'll take a look at the wholesale infrastructure. Uh, wholesale infrastructure was able to uh, collect and distribute uh, all kinds of foods, ingredients, and everything else. And also New York was where the popular cooking press was located. So uh, from the very start of the restaurant businesses in New York, there were celebrity chefs, uh, not just on the cooking channel. Uh, there was an endless cycle of recipe books, recipe uh, articles in uh, the popular press. Um, uh, there were many people that were enlisted uh, to uh, support the restaurant industry, to so support all food industries. One of the, uh, uh, the great uh, case studies is the case study of Crisco where General Foods enlisted uh, uh, the assistance of a great biblical scholar uh, known as the Ramaz to help General Foods uh, uh, spread the appeal of Crisco among Jewish uh, consumers. So, uh, um, so let's uh, let's take a look first of all. Oh, by the way, there were other cities that were able to create local specialties, and you know, uh, Boston had its beans and chowder. Uh, cre uh, uh, Creole cuisine happened in uh, in uh, New Orleans. Uh, there were many restaurant chains that uh, were established this, during this period, uh, usually along the transportation chains. Uh, for example, the uh, Fred Harvey uh, restaurants, and the Fred Harvey Girls uh, that were established along the Santa Fe Union Pacific Railroad lines. But um, uh, New York was where it all kind of ended up and came from. 
uh, with some minor exceptions, New, uh, uh, New York, neither New York nor the United States ever decided to create a national cuisine. Um, you know, New York went the opposite way, making its uh, variety of cuisines its uh, showcase. And it's always been this way, which is why we uh, called this uh, session, uh, New what's for dinner tonight? Everything. So uh, let's take a look at the uh, New York's oldest restaurant. So New York's oldest restaurant is Francis Tavern. Uh, Francis Tavern, uh, as uh, if you went to uh, uh, school in New York, if you grew up in New York, you know Francis Tavern, because everyone, every school went here at least once at some time. Uh, Francis Tavern was where uh, George Washington went after uh, being inaugurated as president of the United States at the corner of Wall and Broad Street at the U.S. Treasury. Uh, there's a statue that's still there that commemorates that event. But afterwards, they went down to uh, Francis Tavern to have a drink and uh, to uh, celebrate their, uh, not only their victory uh, in the American Revolution, but uh, uh, their friendship and conviviality. Uh, this is what Francis Tavern looked like in about 1902 uh, when this uh, uh, postcard by uh, uh, National Art Company was made. Uh, Robert, our uh, technical advisor, uh, showed us what this place looks like today. Looks like it's improved over the years. Uh, they restored the uh, roof line uh, during the 1920s and the buildings next to it are the same. So uh, this is uh, Google Street View uh, from 2021 showing the uh, outdoor uh, seating facility, COVID seating facility, but uh, Francis Tavern is uh, still there just as it was in George Washington's days. But the uh, earliest <laughs> restaurants as we'll see in our next slide, um, uh, the earliest restaurants in New York, uh, sort of mirroring this uh, idea that restaurants were to be a showcase, were tremendous, were enormous. And uh, many of these early restaurants are legendary uh, in their spectacularity. Uh, this is La Louis Martin's uh, restaurant at Times Square. Uh, uh, this is just the entry hall, but uh, uh, enormous, with, uh, made for uh, thousands of people, so that thousands of people literally could dine together. Uh, being in Times Square, this was also the place where uh, a lot of people went after the theater and uh, the um, uh, the starlets, the stars would would kind of hang out there. And this is something else that became emblematic of uh, New York City restaurants. Many of them were star hangouts. And um, uh, this is where the uh, Johnnies would try to meet, uh, the stage door Don Johnnies would try to meet the uh, currently hot starlets. And uh, look at the statuary, but this was uh, typical of the Times Square restaurant of that time, the next card. Uh, shows uh, Rector's, which was uh, equally opulent and uh, bombastic. So this is, uh, again, typical of its time. Shows what was going on at the opposite end. We said that restaurants tried to appeal to everyone, and uh, everyone included uh, people who uh, needed to take their daily lunches at restaurants and or people out just for a quick bite in the evening. And uh, this is kind of a, uh, a unique interior view of um, uh, Cafe of Nuremberg located on Lower Broadway, which um, uh, illustrates uh, uh, something that you saw then, but you don't see anymore, the uh, table d'hote or tab d'hote. Um, it's uh, sort of a format of restaurants where you came in and served uh, a uh, limited uh, 
plate of uh, dishes. Um, chefs were right there. You took it back to your seat. Uh, no table service was necessary. And uh, sometimes uh, thousands of people could be accommodated. And this was something that was very popular in the financial district of uh, Lower Manhattan, where uh, workers needed to take their lunches. I have some more uh, uh, cards from that illustrate this phenomenon of the uh, restaurants for the common person. Uh, Cafe Nuremberg is one. My next card is uh, the uh, Lyon d'Or. Uh, also uh, advertised itself as a uh, uh, table d'hote uh, located in the uh, what was then called the Ladies Mile Shopping District along Sixth Avenue. Uh, but you know, yes, you can imagine uh, this place was uh, filled with tables uh, offering uh, convenient dishes to the. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen who uh, came shopping along the uh, Ladies Mile shopping district. If you go down to uh, 6th Avenue, many of these uh, uh, buildings are still there. The uh, buildings that used to house the, the old department stores that were there, uh, O'Neill's, and uh, eventually the shopping district uh, moved uptown. It uh, went up to 34th Street and uh, Macy's is still there, although uh, Gimbel's is now something else. And uh, they used to say, does Macy's sell Gimbel's? No. Um, and uh, then the shopping district sort of crossed 34th Street. Many of you remember uh, places like Orbach's or Altman's. And then it went up Fifth Avenue and uh, still is located up Fifth Avenue. Here's another. Uh, let me show you another uh, large table d'hote uh, restaurant, White's. Uh, these were tremendous establishments. Uh, uh, seating capacity was 700, located in the financial district. Uh, the next one is also a, a Ladies Mile uh, restaurant. Uh, this is uh, Mallard's. Uh, Ladies Luncheon, uh, located at uh, Fifth Avenue and 35th Street, uh, enormous, uh, and uh, Mallard's was also known for its uh, for its desserts. So let's take a quick look at um, the infrastructure of uh, the wholesale infrastructure that supported the rise of restaurants. Now, I know it's hard to imagine, but at one time, uh, ships were unloaded at the port and um, herds of cattle were uh, marched up the street to the meatpacking district. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the way it was. Uh, the Gansfort market, uh, that uh, terminology Gansfort Market, it reappears every once in a while. But uh, this was the core of uh, what has come to be known as the meatpacking district. Uh, let's say over the years, there's a lot less meat that's been packed there. But this was uh, the core of the wholesaling district that uh, supported uh, the New York restaurant industry. And the uh, support was very broad. Next card shows uh, an Italian uh, import company located on uh, West Broadway. Uh, before West Broadway was a uh, uh, showcase for art dealers. This, uh, uh, this is a, uh, an import company showcasing it, Italian specialties. And if you look closely, you could probably see, uh, oh, at least a uh, hundred or so varieties of olive oil down here. But these are the uh, institutions that fed, in a matter of speaking, fed the restaurant industry, these wholesale institutions. I've got a few more to show you, some interesting ones. I love uh, wholesale, uh, wholesale commerce. 
probably the best uh, known one was the Fulton Fish Market. By the way, most wholesale commerce uh, in the food industry has moved up to Hunts Point Market. Uh, but uh, the Fulton Fish Market served for many years as the fo focal point of, the, uh, of New York's uh, seafood industry. And being a port city, it always had an important uh, seafood industry. I remember uh, back in back in the day, you could uh, come out here early in the morning. You could show up at five, four, <laughs> six o'clock in the morning, and get some fish bargains. And there were lots of uh, places that were open where you could get clam chowder and stuff. Uh, this building at the Fulton Fish Market is still there, even though it's been clad differently. But uh, even the even the Fulton Fish Market, which has kind of evolved into a shopping center, uh, has moved to the Bronx. Here's another, uh, if you think about it, uh, many areas of New York City uh, that today are, are called the meatpacking industry, uh, the meatpacking district or Hell's Kitchen um, or uh, Tribeca, uh, uh, Tribeca especially, or even south of Tribeca, what was known as the uh, uh, Washington Market. Uh, these were heavily involved in the uh, wholesale food distribution industry. This uh, relative visiting is served peacock, fancy salmon and tuna. This is a, a truck located in uh, what's today Tribeca. Uh, the uh, wholesale industry even crossed the river uh, into Brooklyn, and there were sections along the uh, along the docks in uh, in uh, little places like uh, uh, Clinton Hill or Greenpoint or Williamsburg that were also devoted to uh, uh, the wholesale food industry. Um, I grew up on the Lower East Side, and I remember uh, looking across the river and um, uh, smelling the uh, uh, Domino Sugar Factory's uh, uh, refinery. And uh, let's say it uh, didn't smell very sweet. This is uh, SS Long and Brothers, eggs, butter, cheese, and lard. And here's uh, A. Sills, the largest poultry and game establishment in the world. Uh, located in the uh, heart of, uh, again, what's today the uh, still considered the meatpacking district. I, I, I thought this card was interesting, not only for the beautiful uh, building in front, but also for the advertisement on, on the back of this card, because it's a card promoting the open season for game in 1909. So what are, what are the specials of open season for game? Well, venison, of course. And venison uh, here on the east end of Long Island is uh, still available. There's still a, a hunting season for venison out here. But I, I thought it was curious. Uh, one of the uh, game birds uh, offered uh, uh, in the fall is plover. And out here now, you could probably... Uh, be arrested for killing a plover. Uh, plovers have uh, been declared at a, an endangered species, and any place a plover puts down an egg, uh, out here during the uh, during the summer season, because plovers uh, they uh, they they have an interesting migration pattern. They migrate north along the Atlantic, and uh, set down in uh, uh, in the Hamptons. Uh, in the summer or spring summer to lay their eggs and then move on to New England. Um, and there are all kinds of wags out here who have bumper stickers that say, oh, plovers taste just like chicken. But you could get uh, any kind of game bird, quail, wild ducks. So that's uh, uh, New York City uh, the wholesale industry that brought products to the um, uh, to the restaurants. This is a, a 
uh, Cafe Boulevard, uh, very famous as a French and uh, Hungarian. The French-Hungarian combination was very uh, powerful then. And, and the earliest restaurants were not only large, but tended to be continental in, in uh, their scope of, uh, of uh, cuisine. Uh, Cafe Boulevard, uh, this is an early card, as you can tell by the cards, um, eventually evolved into the Cafe Royale, which was a, a very famous as a Jewish restaurant. Uh, this uh, uh, is located at uh, 2nd Avenue and uh, 10th Street, I believe. Um, and 2nd Avenue uh, eventually evolved uh, as from a German neighborhood to a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. And 2nd Avenue became the center of the uh, Lower East Side uh, Yiddish Theater District. Uh, here's another uh, uh, restaurant that was very popular. Some of you may remember this building uh, located on 14th Street near Union Square. Uh, on the Lower East Side, it's uh, the home of Lu Chow's. Uh, Lu Chow was uh, a famous German restaurant modeled after a German hunting lodge uh, that would offer uh, uh, German umpa music uh, uh, several nights of the week. And uh, an, again, a, an enormous uh, interior. Uh, this uh, building came down um, with, uh, many of you, uh, many of you might recall, uh, came down in the '80s and was replaced by one of the uh, uh, dormitories for NYU. Uh, here's another typical uh, German uh, uh, dining hall uh, of that period. This is uh, Pabst Harlem, uh, located on 125th Street. Again, enormous and loud and noisy, lots of beer, lots of, uh, lots of gemütlichkeit, as they say. Uh, some of you uh, in uh, Yorkville may recall uh, this uh, place, uh, the York, York Avenue Brow House. And um, I, I, I take a look at its proprietors, uh, Frank and Charles, but uh, my father had a, uh, had a business on York Avenue. And if you calculate, uh, my father was at 1431. This is at 1563. So they were at a block apart, maybe two blocks apart. Um, but I, I take a look at the outfit worn by the uh, proprietors. And I can tell you that all of the proprietors wear the same outfit, including my father. I looked at this and I said, oh my gosh, this guy looks just like my dad uh, on York Avenue. Here's another uh, big uh, German Zumbrauhaus, big German establishment. And these were the typical early restaurants of uh, New York City, German, Hungarian, uh, French, uh, Romanian. Um, and uh, increasingly Italian. Uh, I worked, um, one of my earliest jobs was at an Italian restaurant up in the Times Square area that many of you I'm sure recall, Mama Leone's. And Mama Leone's was just like this. It was a tremendous restaurant with uh, many rooms. And we had to learn when I worked at Mama Leone's uh, was enough Italian so that the uh, Maitre D, I, I worked there as a Maitre D's assistant, and I had my, uh, I was resplendent in my uh, red blazer, and uh, I was able to uh, uh, welcome the guest by saying "Buonasera, signor, signora," um, and uh, the uh, Maitre D would tell me in Italian uh, which uh, which room and which table number I needed to take the guests the guests too. So I, I learned how to uh, count in Italian and say some, uh, uh, say some things in Italian. But if anybody tried to go beyond that, I had to uh, confess that I was not a native Italian speaker. 
uh, here's a, a tremendous uh, uh, place uh, that's still there at that same spot, King's Chop House. Um, the Chop House was another sort of Irish English invention. Uh, Keynes is, uh, 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 let's say, a little different, but not much different. They they put a different uh, cladding on the buildings, but it still combines uh, several uh, row houses. Uh, one thing that's still located at uh, Keynes is the uh, pipe collection. Uh, if you were a regular at Keynes in the 20s and 30s, you you, had, you were issued a pipe, your, your own uh, souvenir pipe that you could keep there and you could smoke it uh, when you uh, uh, got to Keynes. Uh, the, the pipes are still at the restaurant, uh, as are the uh, chops. And uh, uh, Keynes is famous as a place for whiskeys. And uh, I had a client uh, back in my market research days, came to New York. He would love to go to, love to go to Keynes, and would love to uh, uh, try out their whiskeys. And I remember uh, uh, one night very early in uh, my my business career, we were at Keynes, and uh, uh, kept uh, kept up a pretty uh, hefty pace of uh, uh, Scotch tastings, and the. Um, dinner we had there that evening, which consisted of uh, 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 um, uh, lamb chops, uh, came to uh, about $100, but the uh, scotch bill came to over $500. I thought, oh boy, I, this is a business I love. <laughs> and, uh, hi, sorry, quick question um, in chat, maybe you can answer uh, about the Keynes Chop House, uh, Wood Avenue, over the cross. It's uh, uh, off Sixth Avenue, and uh, let me say Thirty Sixth. Um, okay. Is it on the? Is it on the card? Yeah, thirty. Is that thirty. It's on the card, yeah. Yeah, but it's uh, still a a great. A, New York institution. We'll say one more thing to be out of your way, which is the next one you're going to, you're showing Manny Steakhouse was a, a block from where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, uh, kind of typical of the great New York steakhouses and chop houses, uh, very often associated with uh, Irish or English immigrants to New York and uh, a place to get a mutton chop, a, a veal chop, a lamb chop. And uh, the New York still is very famous for its uh, chop houses. This one at uh, 49th and 3rd, the building is still there. Uh, the building, oh, uh, so maybe someone can help me out here. The building belongs to someone else. But Manny was uh, started out on Forsyth Street. So he started out on, on the Lower East Side. Um, and, and, and by the way, I love uh, uh, these kinds of postcards. These are called linens. They, they have a, a lovely texture. So I, I love collecting these colorful linens of New York. And because I'm married to Sharon Wolf, any, any <laughs> restaurant that has a wolf in its name, I avidly collect. This is Manny Wolf, unfortunately not a relative, but I, I love it nevertheless. For the... Uh, uh, for the other half, the table d'hote uh, evolved into uh, a the um, cafeteria, and for a time, the uh, from the 30s into the 50s, cafeterias were very popular in New York, where you could just get online and sort of get anything that was available at that moment. Um, this is Dixon's Cafeteria, where I'm sure many of you may have spent a meal. Uh, I remember the Garden Cafeteria on the Lower East Side at the corner of uh, East Broadway and Rutgers Street. Uh, the Garden Cafeteria was down the street from the uh, uh, Jewish Daily Forvitz building. And that's where the uh, poets and uh, playwrights and everyone else who inhabited the uh, uh, 
district, uh, uh, that's where they hung out. Here's another uh, kind of uh, uh, an establishment that uh, was meant to appeal to the um, uh, uh, lower middle classes, uh, the Horn and Hard Art Cafeteria, the Automat. And uh, I'm sure many of you have wonderful memories of uh, uh, buying a piece of apple pie for a nickel. And these, these, were, these were serviced by uh, uh, people who stood behind these windows and kept filling up the windows with dishes. And you came over to the windows with uh, whatever price was marked for the uh, dish you were seeking. If it was a uh, chicken pot pie, maybe it was a quarter. If it was uh, uh, a piece of apple pie, maybe it was a nickel and a uh, nickel for coffee. And uh, uh, the automat was a very popular way for New Yorkers to eat over many years. This is a uh, little bit of a later uh, automat image located on 57th Street and 6th Avenue, just uh, down, down the street from uh, Carnegie Hall. Uh, this place was enormous. I, I visited this place very often. Um, and uh, the building is still there. In uh, uh, other places in New York, there were other kinds of restaurant concepts that uh, evolved. Uh, including the novelty restaurant where, you know, there was a theme going on and you could, well, you could dress to match the theme or just uh, uh, let the uh, uh, wait staff, this was the Pirate's Den in, uh, on Christopher Street in Greenwich Village. A uh, good example of a novelty restaurant where they had uh, a uh, pirate fantasy going on. Uh, here's another type of restaurant. This this kind of a postcard is very rare because these uh, little luncheonettes normally did not publish postcards. But the uh, uh, the New York the classic luncheonette diner, where oh well, maybe there were twenty seats, thirty seats, including the counter. And uh, people would prepare your meals while you were sitting at the counter. This is a, in many places, this is a, uh, uh, a restaurant type that has survived, surprisingly. Uh, in many places, it, it used to, there, there was a time, sure you all recall, when oh, every, every single block in the city and in the boroughs too, had at least one or two little restaurant, uh, little luncheonette diners like this, where you could just kind of go ahead in there, have a have a cup of coffee with an omelet or a, or a tuna fish sandwich, and eat for a very reasonable price. Now we said that New York was a, a restaurant city. Uh, I'm sorry, a seafood city. Uh, one place that um, uh, is still functioning, still functions as a very popular place is the uh, Oyster Bar and Restaurant at Grand Central. Uh, still, I think one of the city's best uh, uh, restaurants for seafood and the place where I still consider myself a regular. Here's another shot from the uh, uh, Oyster Bar and Restaurant at Grand Central. Davy Jones Seafood House at Rockefeller Center. This is a fairly early uh, version of it, but again, shows the dimensions of the classic New York Seafood House. And Sloppy Louis. Sloppy Louis was located down at uh, uh, the Fulton Fish Market and a very popular, popular place for clam chowder back in the day. Now, here's a Here's an interesting uh, building. Uh, um, at this moment in time, it was uh, the Cafe Martin. And um, it had just transferred ownership. It had been uh, uh, before this uh, owned by uh, Delmonico's. And Delmonico's 
was uh, regarded as uh, New York's most popular, New York's best restaurant. Uh, Delmonico's had started out in the financial district, but here as uh, it had been this established for several years as Delmonico's and then passed on to the Cafe Martin. But in 1906, this became a very notorious place because the crime of the century, what was called the crime of the century, uh, started out here uh, one evening. Um, and the, the crime of the century was the, move, uh, the, the murder of uh, the uh, noted architect, uh, Stanford White. Stanford White uh, had has many uh, landmarks that he created in New York, but Stanford White was murdered by uh, a gent named Harry Thaw, who had married a, a, a woman named Evelyn Nesbitt. Evelyn Nesbitt was considered one of the one of the beauties, the great beauties of the era. But uh, Stanny and Evelyn had had an affair. Um, and uh, Harry White, uh, Evelyn's husband, um, uh, regarded it as uh, uh, something that was uh, uh, outrageous that Stanny shouldn't have done. Uh, I have to admit that uh, the affair occurred when Evelyn was about 16. Uh, and Stanny was uh, uh, a... Uh, uh, an established uh, man about town, but he did have a thing for young girls. And uh, they uh, encountered each other at the, uh, at, uh, the Cafe Martin uh, before going down the street to what was uh, then uh, the old Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden had been designed, the old Madison Square Garden had been designed by Stanley White. And uh, during uh, uh, the intermission of a play they were going to see at uh, Madison Square Garden that evening, uh, Harry came up and uh, uh, shot Stanley White in the face. And the, uh, that was the crime of the century. Let's go on now to some iconic New York restaurants. And uh, New York restaurants, uh, were famous for lots of things. Uh, one of them was the invention of the Reuben sandwich. Reuben sandwich came from Reuben's restaurant. And uh, people think that, many people think of the Reuben sandwich as a, as a, as a Jewish uh, sandwich. Of course, it, it, it was not strictly a Jewish sandwich because it combined um, um, uh, corned beef and uh, Swiss cheese with uh, some sauerkraut and Russian dressing, but it became a classic and you can still get a Reuben sandwich just about anywhere. A Reuben sandwich came from Reuben's restaurant. This was some other uh, iconic New York places. Uh, one of them was Lindy's. Now, when I was a kid, the place to get a cheesecake was at Lindy's. And Lindy's, uh, this was uh, before Junior's. Um, before Junior's, Lindy's was the place to go for New York, New York cheesecake. Was it uh, was it different from uh, Junior's? Well, I don't know. Memory memory is a funny thing. I think of uh, I think of Junior's as the ultimate, but uh, Lindy's I recall is pretty good. This is a this is a wonderful card that shows a Lindy's uh, during. Uh, what we would call the late Art Deco period, early uh, modern period. So a wonderful postcard, very colorful. And here's another iconic uh, New York uh, establishment. Um, also one of the oldest restaurants in New York is established in uh, 1854 before the Civil War. Uh, this is McSorley's Old Ale House located down on uh, 6th Street on the Lower East Side, located close to Cooper Union, NYU. This was kind of like the student hangout of its age. And um, I remember for 25 cents, which I uh, spent here on several occasions, 
Uh, for 25 cents, you could get uh, two mugs of beer and uh, their least expensive sandwich, which was either a uh, uh, cheddar cheese or a Limburger cheese with onions or a uh, liverwurst uh, sandwich with onions. And, and let's say the onions uh, 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 were uh, uh, kind of a, a unique evil. You didn't care about the onions or the uh, or the cheese on your breath because uh, McSorley's old ale house uh, invited only gents, uh, locked women out until uh, protests occurred in the uh, 70s. And uh, they, they, after uh, 100 years of being an all male establishment, McSorley's finally started admitting women. But this was a New York classic. Here's another New York classic. The Sabrets Hot Dog Stand. Uh, this one located in Washington Square Park, where you could get your classic Sabrets hot dog. Um, this is Washington Square Park. It looks about the like the early '60s, and uh, the Sabrets uh, hot dog would, would cost uh, 15 cents. Then it went up to 20 cents. And when it a quarter, it was an outrage. But uh, I remember, like everyone else, used to love to uh, get a get a hot dog and dump the uh, uh, onions with uh, 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 onions with red sauce on it. And that was a great lunch to have in Washington Square Park. There's just a few blocks here. But this is a, an interesting concept, the bird in hand hangover breakfast. You almost never see breakfast advertised in uh, New York restaurants, but this is a, a hangover breakfast, 50 cents in your, your writ. Judy, do we, um, do we have some questions or some discussion or? Oh, just uh, not a question, a comment. Uh, Barbara uh, put in, um in chat something I have remembered also um, that Manny Wolf's Chop House on uh, 49th and 3rd is the building is still there. Uh, it's a small building. It is now the Smith and Walensky uh, Steakhouse. And um, also doing a little Googling here. Um, I didn't know this before, even though it was a block from where I grew up, uh, that it, it, you may have known this high. It started out as a buggy whip factory. <laughs> <laughs> A, a terrific occupation at one time, uh -huh. I'm sure. Right. So you, you can go ahead. That's the only comment so far. Dude, here's one that I thought was uh, a delicious one for marketers. And this was uh, the uh, old Butoni uh, Spaghetti Bar in Times Square, which uh, was established uh, not as a profit-making restaurant, but to acquaint the public with uh, delicious Butoni products at special introductory prices. It was a promotional restaurant. Um, and uh, as a, a restaurant, uh, as a spaghetti was catching on in the uh, uh, 1950s, people needed a little bit of inducement to, uh, to eat spaghetti. Now, um, if, uh, if you think of uh, New York City restaurants, I'm sure uh, uh, you'll think of the um, uh, many uh, Italian, uh, the many uh, New York delis, Jewish delis uh, that existed. And uh, I think the Italian restaurants uh, were in New York were very unique for many reasons. First of all, the Italian restaurants were the first to uh, pick up on design trends. And here's a beautiful card in uh, the uh, modern style, which uh, began proliferating in New York. Um, you, do, so you would consider this, uh, some would consider this mid-century modern or modern. Um, uh, across from the uh, uh, New, York, New York Public Library, but it's, uh, it's beautifully designed and uh, shows uh, uh, 
uh, shows its taste. And here's another one, uh, Tony's Streamline Restaurant, uh, showing off its uh, streamline, modern style, uh, probably in about the uh, uh, mid-50s. But there's another word that's used here for the first time. Uh, this is the oldest uh, card that I could find that uses the word pizzeria. And uh, uh, it uh, shows off a great New York invention, the pizza. Uh, there are many who, uh, 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 who would say not only is uh, the pizza a New York invention, but it's the only place where you can get decent pizza. Uh, and you always hear about decent pizza. And uh, the claim is that only New York has the appropriate water uh, for making a decent pizza. Uh, now I can I can attest. I, I began I began uh, coming into uh, Italy, and until about the 1980s in Italy, you did not see a, a, a did not see pizzerias anywhere. Pizzeria pizza was uh, uh, often thought of as home food, and uh, when uh, I saw my first Italian pizzeria in in uh, oh, probably the mid '80s, it was located uh, down the street from uh, from the uh, Milan railroad station. Uh, the Italians thought it was uh, this amazing thing, that, and it was an amazing thing because pizza is one of those foods that was invented in New York and then imported to Italy and then re-imported uh, for authenticity in New York. So this is uh, Tony Streamline Pizzeria. It, 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 among the Italian restaurants of New York is also where the small intimate restaurant style began to be established. And uh, this uh, small intimate style began to overtake the, uh, the trend of the large restaurants. So that by the 1940s or 1950s, uh, this was the incipient style, even though uh, some places like uh, Luchow's or Mom Leone's were still in business. Uh, it was uh, kind of a little more fashionable to go to a, a smaller Italian uh, or French restaurant. Here's uh, uh, Nova Napoli restaurant located on the, in Little Italy, located on Grand Street near Mulberry. Uh, again, indicative of a of a small town. I, uh, this is a card from Buffalo, technically, but uh, Santoris Pizzeria in Buffalo. And I thought this was uh, especially nice, not only as an Art Deco card, but because it had a, a jukebox in the center of it. Uh, Nino, Nino Nella's on Charles Street. As many of you know, this is also a, a smaller, uh, extension of Little Italy in uh, the village. But this is where the uh, red checkered tablecloth. Uh, Tsukas in Times Square. The, um, uh, there's something that's here that became popular at that time, the, the Roman antipasto buffet. And uh, uh, the Roman antipasto buffet became popular at that time because of the tremendous uh, smorgasbord trend that had become established in New York. So, but I, I noticed that the antipasto buffet often stayed, and there were restaurants that kept the antipasto buffet into the oh, past uh, past the millennium. And, and by the way, I, I wondered whether that was authentic. And I did notice in, uh, in Rome, there were several antipasto buffets. Uh, one uh, in Rome and Milan uh, that were always kind of interesting. Here's Castle Home Smorgasbord. Uh, during the 1950s and early 60s, Smorgasbord took over uh, New York City restaurants and the idea that you could go up and oh, keep uh, getting uh, oh, nice seafood uh, treats or 
other Scandinavian treats, uh, Scandinavian Swedish meatballs, um, became a real New York trend in the 50s. Uh, here's another New York icon, Sardis. Sardis is the iconic uh, uh, New York theater district uh, restaurant where if you got your caricatures put up on the walls at Sardis, you knew you had made it. And uh, this was the place where many, many theater companies would go after their openings uh, for parties. It became known as uh, the place where you could always spot celebrities uh, in the theater district. Uh, here's a place uh, typical of the kinds of uh, smaller French and Italian restaurants that became popular in the 40s and 50s. Uh, this is the Cafe Brittany, Brittany du Soir, which uh, we're located on 9th Avenue on the Upper West Side. This is very meaningful to me because uh, a date at the Cafe Brittany was my, my first big date. Um, and um, it, was, uh, it was a very big date, particularly because the next day I came down with appendicitis. Here's uh, another uh, small uh, French restaurant offering uh, uh, cheese souffle at La Bourgogne. Uh, and I have to admit, uh, a, good, uh, a good French souffle is uh, incomparable. Some, some French restaurants uh, during the uh, 40s and 50s became supreme in, in uh, being uh, upscale and offering uh, 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 a very superior uh, dining experience. Uh, dinner, candlelight supper at Le Bijou. It's a beautiful postcard, beautiful uh, um, uh, linoleum cut. Uh, Andre's uh, restaurant and cafe on the Upper East Side. And uh, here's a place, uh, Lutece, which for many years was considered New York's best restaurant. And I remember an evening uh, of dining at Lutece was uh, an extremely special experience. Now, New York was also the place, as I said, where you could get everything, where everything was available. And uh, New York made a point of uh, letting you know that everything was available. Here is our specialty at the Balkan American restaurant, uh, chopped horse hearts, braised to perfection and served on a bed of rice and chickpeas with or without Balkan sauce. And I think that decision about whether you get it with or without would be a critical decision, <laughs> but um, this was when uh, there was actually an area called Little Armenia. You don't hear it talked about as Little Armenia anymore, even though the Armenian church is still there on 2nd Avenue and in the 20s. Uh, but the area around there used to be called uh, Little Armenia. Here's another interesting uh, place, a Syrian uh, Arabic Arabian restaurant in the old Washington market. Son of the Sheik restaurant, as many of you might know, uh, later migrated when, uh, when the um, uh, Washington market was uh, torn down. Uh, Son of the Sheik restaurant migrated to Brooklyn Heights and became very popular while it was in Brooklyn Heights. We ate there many times when it was in Brooklyn Heights. Son of the Sheik. And here's another... Uh, Salon India Inn, another kind of uh, exotic cuisine. Uh, Indian cuisines are thought of as much less exotic uh, nowadays, even though at that time they were, they were considered all oh, just exceptionally uh, exotic. But uh, New York became uh, known for its Chinese restaurants many Chinese restaurants. And here are some uh, examples of uh, Chinese restaurants. Um, uh, this one located in Chinatown, uh, the Lung Fang restaurant. Uh, 
uh, opposite and Levian sons had to, <laughs> I guess you had to reassure people. Uh, uh, here's the Eurasia restaurant also located in, uh, in Chinatown. Some of you might recognize the, um, um, uh, the um, uh, Manhattan Bridge, uh, Chinatown Charlie's, Times Square. Some of these old, uh, uh, the Chinese kitchen, Trias, uh, offering Cantonese. The other fad that occurred in the uh, early 50s was the um, Latin cuisine fad, the mambo dance. It could include mambo dancing and it could include the introduction of uh, many uh, Spanish, Puerto Rican, um, Cuban dishes that were not formally known to uh, American audiences. American customers. And this one, El Chico, in the heart of Greenwich Village, was one of the first of the uh, exotic uh, uh, Spanish, Cuban, Puerto Rican restaurants. Here's another one, the Nueva Rumba, uh, located up on uh, Upper Broadway, up in the uh, uh, City College area. And uh, Sochito, Mexican restaurants, Mexican restaurants were very rare when this uh, postcard came out in, in the early 50s, but it has since proliferated all over New York. And uh, the Russian Tea Room, uh, Midtown area near Carnegie Hall was uh, always known for its uh, different uh, Russian restaurants. There were also Russian restaurants on uh, the Lower East Side, 14th Street, Ukrainian restaurants. But uh, the Russian Tea Room was uh, uh, particularly famous. And I, I love this card, not only because it has a wonderful, whimsical uh, uh, illustration, but because uh, for many restaurants, I worked at the, uh, at the check room. I was the guy taking coats. Here's uh, the uh, celebrity nightclub restaurant, the Stork Club, also located in Midtown. And I keep trying to figure out who's who in this picture. And the two that I can recognize in the uh, lower uh, left-hand corner are uh, Arthur Godfrey there with uh, Dorothy Kilgallen. But, and, um, um, I, I have trouble. Um, the um, and as long as we're on the topic of celebrity restaurants, we have to mention all the uh, wonderful soul food celebrity restaurants that grew up in Harlem. Uh, they they said it was everyone's dream at the end of a successful boxing or a sports career to uh, open up uh, a restaurant in Harlem and really become. Uh, rich. This is uh, the Joe Lewis restaurant. Uh, whoops, let's go back. Uh, Joe Lewis uh, was uh, a world heavyweight champion after beating Max, Max Schmeling, uh, the uh, German fighter who Joe had originally lost to Schmeling. And uh, this was uh, as uh, World War II was uh, uh, continuing to become a, uh, a growing pop possibility. And uh, let's say that the entire world depended on uh, Joe Lewis to win that fight against Max Schmeling, which he did. He won it in about a minute and a half and uh, then became the uh, uh, a great personality. But there are many other, um, uh, many other personalities that either opened up their own or bought restaurants uh, uh, in Harlem. And, Mickey Mantle uh, had a restaurant. Mm -hmm. hmm? Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle, um, Mickey Mantle had, a, had a restaurant over on 57th Street. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, who am I thinking of? Um, uh, uh, there were many, many popular sports yeah, celebrities okay. that opened up restaurants in New York. And uh, then, of course, New York was 
exceptionally famous for its uh, Jewish restaurants, its delicatessens. And let's say delicatessen is delicatessen food is one of those other things, just like uh, the pizza that's a completely New York invention. Uh, the, in, in, in Europe, in the little shtetls, people did not eat uh, uh, pastrami on rye bread. It was uh, one of those things that uh, happened in New York and was turned into traditional old Jewish food. Um, and here at Moskowitz and Lupowitz, this is another place where I worked. Um, and I, I worked the Czech room here at Moskowitz and Lupowitz. Uh, Moskowitz and Lupowitz was like the Sardis of the uh, Yiddish theater district. It was located at 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street. Um, let's say biggest danger to me at uh, Moskowitz and Lupowitz was uh, being a, <laughs> attacks from older women. Here's another great uh, uh, Jewish restaurant of the Lower East Side, Jack Silverman's Old Romanian, the home of the Mush Steak. Uh, one of the ways, again, that uh, 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 people in restaurants all over New York tried to distinguish themselves was by creating their own uh, uh, dish concept. The mush steak was a combination of steak and uh, uh, kasha varnishkas. Jack Silverman himself became uh, well known as an empresario. He moved, he moved his place uptown and uh, uh, became uh, the uh, owner of uh, the International Club. Here's uh, Bernstein's, uh, Bernstein's on Essex, kosher restaurant. And this is uh, one of the early um, delicatessen Jewish restaurants that I could find. Um, before Bernstein's, uh, 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 rest Jewish restaurants very rarely offered uh, delicatessens. They, they were Jewish restaurants, they would offer uh, chicken soup, chicken soup with kreplach, uh, or um, uh, but uh, Bernstein's on Essex uh, offered uh, delicatessen meat. It was a great landmark of the Lower East Side. In, in its later years, uh, Bernstein's became famous for offering kosher Chinese food. So many people went to Bernstein's in Essex for Chinese cuisine. And here's uh, my, uh, my final card, um, the stage, deli stage deli, stage delicatessen. And I remember there was a time when people would uh, have serious debates about which was better, the stage deli or the Carnegie which was, uh, they were about a block apart from each other. And they were both uh, huge celebrity hangouts. And this uh, postcard from the stage uh, illustrates its uh, status as, uh, as a celebrity hangout. Eddie Cantor's there, Mae West, um, many others. So New York City restaurants, wish you were here. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. So um, before we let you go, um, before we officially thank you, um, there have been a couple mentions of other uh, sports figures who opened restaurants. So Anne wrote uh, Jack Dempsey had one. Karen mentioned yeah. Rusty Staub. And Robert uh, mentioned Broadway Joe Namath. So mm -hmm. we want to do that. Um, and I wanted to tell you um, briefly about, uh, I think I mentioned this in your uh, nightlife session, um, a restaurant near me that was um, a, a beautiful New York mishmash. It was Freeman Chum's Chinese restaurant. I just discovered there is a card for it. And they took over um, a, uh, a French uh, nightclub. So when you went there, when my mother used to take us there when we were kids, um, you would see huge murals of um, French uh, ladies, all with a cloth and the hat and the hat box, et cetera, and little poodles uh, walking down the Champs-Élysées. I thought that was great. 
That's great. Um, as, so, as long as we're on celebrity restaurants, uh, got to mention uh, Wilt Chamberlain, who took over Small's Paradise, and it became Wilt's Small's Paradise. And <laughs> Wilt used to hang out there. And uh -huh. uh, well, let's call on some people here. Um, first, we're going to Rita, and then to Barbara. Go ahead, Rita. Well, I think I've been to almost every one of those restaurants. <laughs> I, but, I thought you would. <laughs> my my father-in-law, uh, during World War II, acquired a huge restaurant at 33 West 33rd Street called Major's Cabin Grill. Oh, yeah. uh, I think it seated almost 2,000 people when the downstairs was open. And people said it was in the garment district. Uh, that those were his customers. That wasn't true. New York was very uh, carefully divided and the garment district ended at 34th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. Right. And this was next to the Empire State Building on 33rd Street. So, so, that was the, 33rd. The so those were the buyers for Orbachs and Macy's. The jewelry Macy's. district, is that, <laughs> was that the custom jewelry district then? Uh, partly, he owned the building and there were some costume jewelry uh, yeah. places in it, but I think it was mostly buyers uh, yeah. for uh, the, the big department stores. But it was interesting how New York was divided. Yeah. And of course, my, my first French food ever was at Chambord. And I didn't have the faintest idea of what I was eating. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> you like that? Thank you. Well, you know, that, that first night that we went to the, uh, uh, to, to the Cafe Brittany, uh, I went to my French teacher and asked him, what do you order at a French restaurant? And he suggested that we order, you know, he gave us a, a little list of things. Uh, <laughs> uh, Coco, Coco van, beef bourguignon. And Whatever that kind of, was. <laughs> you know, right. We kind of pulled out our little cheat sheets when we ordered. I want to squeeze in a couple of more comments. And there are some notes in chat about uh, how terrific uh, your presentation is. And Rod okay. Gilbert was also mentioned in the sports restaurant. We're going to go to Barbara and then um, to Karen. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, Small's Paradise was really a happening place. I can remember I was 17 years old and my date took me there. Somehow they didn't ask for ID and oh, yeah. it was dumping. And incidentally, Will Chamberlain lived in my building for a while. <laughs> he was <laughs> well, very I, tall. <laughs> I, had, I had a special, you know, my boss told me to get a cabaret license because I was working in places at 16 where uh, liquor was served. And um, so I got a cabaret license and whenever I pulled out my cabaret license ever, ever since then, people just assumed that it gave me the right to drink at that establishment. So <laughs> I, I worked that, uh, I worked that angle myself. Yeah. Let me go to Karen, uh, who's got a story. Yeah. Go ahead. Just, just quickly, my dad in the 50s was an accountant for Longchamp's restaurants. Oh, yeah. And um, they had a series of restaurants, the Virginian and the uh, Californian. And oh, I know oh, that they were goodness. part of the Longchamp's chain because whenever we ate out, we got a discount there. So we would always eat at one of, one of those restaurants. And one quick thing about Sardi's that I didn't find out until a few years ago when I was having dinner with a, a friend of mine who was an actor and he asked for the actor's menu. And there's an actor's menu at Sardi's that they give out, and the prices are lower than on the regular menu. Oh, that's great. Hey, you know, when um, you, you got to leave something out of these presentations, but New York had wonderful restaurant chains. What I remember is the Schraff's chain. Uh, there were a bunch of those on the Upper East Side. Uh, and um, uh, the Longchamp chains. Those were great. So uh, let me just say, I, I won't read them all, but there are some uh, wonderful chat um, from Damaris, uh, from Michael, from Joanne, and uh, Marilyn uh, saying what a great presentation this is. Uh, you may be able to see those. And Marilyn is faced with a predicament about 
where to go for dinner. And all I can say is I'm very glad I had lunch before this presentation. Uh, I want to uh, let several people deserve thanks uh, for the presentation. Obviously, hi for putting together um, such a wonderful presentation. But I also want to thank uh, Robert uh, Chagenerous, who, um, Jenner Key, sorry, um, who helped us through with tech, Hal and Alan uh, from Postcard clubs and, and the Metro car people who came to join us today. It was all really wonderful. So um, what's the eat? Well, I guess the next Hi, <laughs> thank you so much on behalf of the board. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank okay. You. Take care. Uh, and, and forget, nobody, nobody has to eat horse hearts. <laughs>